What is going on, everybody? James Hancock here. I'm back to review the new sci-fi action flick, 65, starring Adam Driver. And I'll avoid all spoilers initially, but toward the end of my video, we'll have to get into more specific criticisms, but I will give you fair warning before doing so. But full disclosure, I was not that excited to see this, but my options for this weekend were see this or go see Scream 6. And I haven't even seen Scream 5 yet, so I decided upon... 65 because the filmmakers behind it, Scott Beck and Brian Woods, they wrote the uh, the screenplay for the movie A Quiet Place, but they're working as a writer-director duo on this particular movie. And also, I feel like no matter what Adam Driver is in, good, bad, mediocre, he always brings the heat. His professionalism, his intensity, his talent, his just overall physicality in his roles. I'm always impressed by Adam Driver, and I think he's one of the most impressive actors of his generation but the sad reality is he's the only thing that holds this movie together. I thought this movie was as bland and forgettable and disposable as sci-fi movies come, but because Adam Driver, just by like sheer force of will and talent, is like trying to keep the movie alive, it is watchable. But I don't think anybody should go out of their way to spend money to see it in a theater. Like maybe have it on as like background noise while you're making dinner or paying bills or whatever the case might be. And I suspected something might be dreadfully wrong with this movie when I learned that the review embargo did not lift until today, the day of its release. And I did not go to a press screening. I went and saw it at a regular uh, Regal Theater, which was maybe had like 10 or 20 people in it around 4 o'clock this afternoon. But usually, not always, but usually, if a studio is really confident about a movie and its chances, they start doing press screenings weeks ahead of the movie's release. But in the back of my mind, I, was, I kept telling myself, what if the studio is wrong? Like, what if they've got a, a really cool flick on their hands and they're just overlooking its merits? Because it does have a few things going forward. I mean, it's barely over 90 minutes long. I wish more action movies would be roughly between like 90 and 100 minutes. I feel like that's the perfect length for a movie. You don't need a two and a half hour movie every time you make something. And more importantly, it's not a remake. It's something brand new. And I wish more filmmakers would take a crack at cooking up their own ideas and their own original concepts. There's something to be said for a movie that just tries to be a base hit and not a home run. Not every movie needs to be Avatar or Avatar 2. Sometimes just a tight, solid, economical genre film is all I need. And also going into it, I thought to myself, God, Adam Driver, he's worked with so many great filmmakers. He must have seen something in the script that would attract him to this project because this is just a short list of some of the filmmakers he's worked with over the last like 12 or 13 years, but Martin Scorsese, Ridley Scott, Terry Gilliam, Steven Soderbergh, Spike Lee, Jim Jarmusch, the Coen brothers, Steven Spielberg, and Clint Eastwood, to name but a few. And the guy's not even 40 yet. I mean, I can't think of any actor his age who's worked with more legendary directors than friggin' Adam Driver. And I always enjoy seeing Adam Driver play roles where you can see some of his military background informing his approach to the character. I think he was a Marine for almost three years. And when he's moving through the woods and, you know, fighting dinosaurs and you know, battling the elements and all that kind of stuff, then, uh, yeah, you believe it. I mean, he is very convincing when he is mowing things down. It also just occurred to me, I didn't even mention the plot of this movie yet, but it's a real simple concept. You have a spaceship going through space, transporting a lot of people in suspended animation. They get hit by an asteroid. They crash land on Earth 65 million years ago, and suddenly you've got a situation where Adam Driver and the other sole survivor, a little girl who does not speak English, they have to make their way across a couple of miles of dinosaur-infested territory to make it to an escape pod in order to get back into space. And that is the story, which leads me to my first major criticism. And if you don't want any spoilers at all, now's the time to bail out. But when it comes to the less satisfactory ingredients to this flick, this is one of those movies that feels like it never got developed beyond just a simple pitch. Like, I mean, you can easily see Scott Beck and Brian Woods sitting down, talking to a producer, or talking to an exec, and saying, wouldn't it be cool if someone with futuristic tech had an adventure on prehistoric Earth? I'm like, yes, go write that movie, let's make it. But that's as far as they got. Like, they didn't develop the idea at all. They didn't add, they didn't even have, like, the courage to add a few, like, I don't know, simple gimmicks or tricks that you might expect. It's so straightforward and so basic and so simplistic, it almost will kind of leave you scratching your head like, is that it? That's all you're going to do? Like the one major ingredient that gets introduced prior to the end of the film is when they realize like the giant asteroid that's coming in that we all know helped wipe out the dinosaurs where it's coming. So they've got a little bit of a ticking clock scenario. But when I watched the trailer, I thought this was going to be like a time travel thing, almost like he went off into space 
and got turned around and came back and accidentally like flew through a warm wormhole and landed on Earth right where he started, but 65 million years in the past, basically making it impossible for him to be rescued, but that's not the case at all. He's just an alien a long time ago flying with his alien species and they just happen to crash on Earth. It's a real fucking strange kind of limp idea for a movie that does absolutely nothing to get you excited about learning more about this world. Like when it comes to science fiction, I always, I always look at science fiction writers the way I look at martial artists. Like some people are white belts. They just got started, they're a beginner. And then you have the real masters out there who are black belts where they write or they wrote like incredible episodes of The Twilight Zone or they wrote incredible science fiction novels. Like those are the black belts. Like think of the best science fiction concepts of all time. Those are the black belts. This definitely is white belt territory where the writers feel like guys who saw a handful of dinosaur movies, most likely Jurassic Park, and just thought, of, hey, like we're smart, we're talented, we can write a dinosaur movie. But in a world where we've had like, what, six Jurassic Park movies? Don't do a dinosaur movie unless you're going to do something wildly new or wildly original. I feel like the movie almost would have been better if they just made it an alien planet where you could at least have some variety of creatures that are trying to hunt them down. Creatures that we have not already seen a million times over in some of the most commercially successful films ever made. But as I was watching it, I kept thinking to myself, there's something really weird going on with the editing. I feel like the editing was either like a hatchet job that destroyed what might have been a good movie, or it was a hatchet job that was an attempt at saving what might have been an even worse movie. But it makes these giant like narrative leaps and like jumps to strange emotions, especially like in the first like 20, 30 minutes, where you're like, wait a second, like suddenly Adam Driver's like suicidal or crying or just acting like a total maniac, but they don't give us anything that kind of leads up to those emotions. It just makes it feel not confusing because it's very basic, but just perplexing. It just leaves you scratching your head like, what is going on and why is this so stupid? But for me, the Achilles heel of this movie is the way the character of Koa, played by Ariana Greenblatt, the way that character is written, makes you root for the dinosaurs. And that's a recurring problem with a lot of movies where screenwriters will make children so loathsome and so annoying and so irritable that you start rooting for the bad guys to kill them. And the same thing happened to me when I was watching Jurassic World where there were these two little kids running through the park. And I, I spent the whole movie hoping and praying that something would just rip them limb from limb. And that might make me sound like a psychopath, but it is a problem in Hollywood where screenwriters don't know how to write children, or very rarely do. Like, there are obviously exceptions to the rule. Like, watch Bad News Bears, the original. Those kids are fucking amazing, and you will fall in love with each and every single one of them and be rooting for them all the way. But just to give you another example, Quantumania, Cassia Lang, the way they wrote her, makes you root against her. You want Kang to kill her. But getting back to 65, pretty much every single scene involving this character falls into one or two categories. You have these scenes where he's teaching her like really basic rudimentary English, like, you know, go or shh, like be quiet and things like that. And somehow these scenes where she can't understand anything over the course of about 12 hours, suddenly she's a master of the English language and can understand really complex instructions and uh, commands that he's giving her. But you could give the movie a pass on that front, if not for the fact that otherwise she's constantly doing stupid things where he has to bail her out, whether that's picking berries that you shouldn't eat or getting scared and running off and like getting into even more danger or the worst case of all, they're walking along, they see all these dinosaurs that look scary as hell and one's stuck in the mud. And she insists upon stopping to pull the dinosaur out, even though there are a bunch of predators around. And it reminded me very much of Cassie Lang in Quantumania, where there's no struggle that she will, is willing to overlook, just getting them into one scrape after another. And there's one part of the movie where they're stuck in a cave underground, which leads to easily the dumbest moment all movie, where we see her drawing stick figures on the wall of a cave as Adam Driver's trying to dig their way out. And obviously they're trying to suggest like, oh, all these... 30,000 year old cave paintings that we've discovered like they all come from this character a long time ago at any rate I feel like I'm starting to get unnecessarily cruel because this is not a, one of those movies where I feel like deep feelings of loathing for it the way I do with some other movies like it's not gonna incite people to hatred they're like oh, I will never see movies by these filmmakers ever again it's just mediocre adequate at best unoriginal uninspired, bland science fiction, and I recommend everybody save their money. However, there was one silver lining to seeing this in the theater. Prior to the movie, they showed the trailer for a movie that I'm now putting on my calendar, but the uh, new Jennifer Lawrence comedy, No Hard Feelings. I feel like when it comes to the comedy genre, 
they don't even really make comedies anymore, or if they do, they tend to be for kids or kind of like disguised, like in the context of another genre, like the jokes in the Marvel franchise and that sort of thing. But finally, with no hard feelings, we have a legit sex comedy. And when I got home, I watched the Red Band trailer, which was even funnier than the trailer that I saw in the theater. So if you're in the mood for what might be a really funny sex comedy, check out the trailer for No Hard Feelings. I mean, at a minimum, it looks like one of those movies where like the first 30 minutes will be funny. And then it'll probably turn into a really sappy, stupid melodrama. But if it makes me laugh more than a handful of times, then mission accomplished. But I think that's all I have to say, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this video. But before I go, I must bring you a public service announcement from Manscaped, the official sponsor of my podcast, Wrong Real, because they now have beard products and a brand new nose and ear hair trimmer. If you haven't already heard, the leaders in Below the Waist Grooming are traveling north of your South Pole with their revolutionary Beard Hedger Pro Kit. Plus, they've now launched the brand new Weed Whacker 2.0, which confirms they have all the best tools for your hygiene toolbox. Time for you to upgrade your toolbox by going to manscaped.com and using the discount code WRONGREAL in all caps for 20% off plus free shipping. Also, check out my podcast if you want to hear some uh, long-form conversations about film history. But the Beard Hedger Pro Kit is the ultimate package that makes it easier than ever to craft your signature look. This thing is an elite beard trimmer. The Beard Hedger is tough on hair but smooth on your face, leading to single-stroke efficiency that brings satisfaction one stroke at a time. And with a nice beard, your face is perfectly groomed, right? Wrong. You need to keep an eye out for those tough-to-trim ears and nose hairs. The brand new Weed Whacker 2.0 offers improved blades and skin-safe technology with a no-tugging guarantee. It's never been so painless to mind your manholes. So if your, your manholes are in desperate need of some grooming and maintenance, please consider making a purchase using the discount code WRONGREAL. You'd be helping me and all my commentary endeavors, but... Hope everybody has a great weekend. Sorry, I kind of popped my had a brain freeze there for a second, but hope everybody has a great weekend. Please remember to like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell. But I can't thank you enough for watching. But more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.